Well, please, people of God, turn your Bibles this morning once again to Paul's letter to the church of the Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, page 1253 in the Adoration Bibles, 1253. Our focus for this morning will be on verses 5 to 11, but for the sake of context, we'll begin reading again at verse 1 of chapter 3. As we read God's word together, let's do so with those words of Psalm 32 impressed upon our hearts. But be ye not unruly, nor slow to understand. Be not perverse, but willing to heed my wise command. Whoever has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you, the sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, I once heard of a PCA pastor who for many years had the privilege of serving as a military chaplain in the United States Army. And as you can imagine, it would not be at all uncommon for young men especially to to come to him and to meet with him to ask about whether or not they too should consider registering for military service. But besides having a, a general desire to serve their country, various reasons would would be given by these young men. Some had a desire to to see the world. Others were were drawn to the place and purpose that military service might afford them. But in order to help these young men really consider what joining the military might mean, this military chaplain would always begin by by asking them the question, "Are, are you willing to die for your country? Because the answer to that question sort of puts all the other questions into perspective. Are you willing to die for your country? And yet this military chaplain often found that most young men were readily able to answer the question, yes, if, if necessary, out of love for my country, I would be willing even to die for her sake. But if they answered his question that way, he would always ask them a follow-up question. And he would say that you're willing to die for your country, that's good and well, but would you be willing to kill for your country? That, of course, is a more sobering question and would typically give would-be soldiers greater pause. But as we direct our focus this morning to what Paul is saying to us here in verses 5 and following, we're confronted with Similar kinds of questions, aren't we? Because here the Apostle Paul is urging us to kill. To kill that dimension of ourselves that is earthly. But we also recognize this morning that Paul, like me, is simply a messenger and ambassador of the Lord Jesus. And so, as we come to verse 5 of Colossians chapter 3, it is in fact the Lord Jesus who comes to us. It's the Lord Jesus who comes to us now and the preaching of the word, and asks you, do you love me enough to kill for me? Do you love me enough to kill for me? 
It's a sobering question, isn't it? Do you love your Savior more than you love your sin? If you had to to part with one or the other, which would it be? This congregation is really the question that undergirds the apostles' words here. If, If God put his son to death for you, then won't you put your sin to death for him? Jesus, we know, has given us everything. As we heard last time, Jesus has given you a new identity and a new destiny. Your life is now hidden with Christ in God, and when Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. That's what Paul has just said. A new identity, a new destiny. As Article 26 of the Belgian Confession says so beautifully, there is no one in all the world who who loves you more than Jesus Christ loves you, for although he was in the form of God, he emptied himself, he took upon himself the form of a servant for you, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We can see throughout his life the lengths that Christ was willing to go to to show his love for us. And now the question is set before you, to what extent do you love him? Do you love him enough to kill for him? Are you willing to part with your sins, even those sins that you continue to hold so near and dear to your heart? Are you willing to kill those sins so that the entirety of your life might be offered up to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him? As I mentioned last time, as you've heard me say before, knowing whose you are, is what now defines who you are. But as we heard last time, knowing who you are ought to have a profound impact on the way you are, on what you love, and and how you think, on what you do, and what you say, and and on everything in between. And this is what Paul is, is pressing upon us once again here. Having reminded his readers of their new identity and their new destiny, he now sets before them their new duty. In verses 5 and 8, Paul calls us to put to death and to, and to put away all the sins, all the vices that, that belong to the old man with the warning that on account of those things, the wrath of God is coming. But to encourage us in this duty, Paul goes on to remind us that you and I have been incorporated into a new humanity. Once again, in verses 9 and 10, Paul anchors his readers in the grammar of the gospel. For the imperative requirements of verses 5 and 8 are are grounded in the indicative realities of verses 9 and 10. They are made possible, says Paul, because you have put off the old self with its practices and you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And then in the third place, Paul reminds us that we have not only been incorporated into, into a new humanity, We've also been brought into a new community. A new community where there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but a new community where Christ is all and in all. But in verse 5, Paul begins with our duty. Listen again to how he says it. Put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you, the sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. And notice how at the start of verse 5, as Paul urges us to do this, as Paul urges us to, to mortify our sin, to put our sin to death, he doesn't do so with the law, but he does so with the gospel. That's what the word therefore is therefore. That word, therefore, at the start of verse 5 is so important because it directs his readers to to read verses 5 and following in light of what he's just said in verses 1 through 4. Paul, you see, is grounding his exhortation to put our sin to death in the reality that you and I have already been risen with Christ in God and that our lives are now hidden with Christ in God. If it were not so, then living out Paul's words here would be Utterly impossible. If Paul was calling us to fight sin and to, and to put our sin to death on our own strength, then we readily admit that we would fall and fail at, at every turn. As we confess in Lord's Day 52, we are, 
We are weak. We are so weak that we cannot stand on our own, even for a moment. But as the rest of that Lord's Day tells us, God upholds us, doesn't he? God upholds us and makes us strong by his Spirit, so that we may not be defeated in this spiritual fight, but that we may resist our enemies until we finally win the complete victory. And that's what Paul is setting before us here with the word, therefore. The Christian duty to mortify sin is not an easy one. As all of us know all too well, putting sin to death is hard. It's, it's painful. There are times when it seems like it must be impossible. And so we need to have this clear in our minds, that Christian duty is never detached from Christian identity. As I said last time, our status is the base of our service and not the other way around. And so we have to understand this morning that, that it's not as though Paul is suggesting here that in order to find acceptance with God, you first have to, to get your act together. You first have to clean yourself up enough to, to have a relationship with him. That's not what Paul is saying here. And Paul is certainly not saying that if you still have sexual sin in your life, then you must not be a real Christian. That's not what Paul's saying. That, of course, is one of Satan's evil devices, isn't it, to, to point at your sin and to, and to whisper in your ear, if you were a real Christian, you would never commit that sin. To recognize that Paul, in this letter, is speaking here to Christians. As he, as he highlights in chapter 1, verse 2, Paul is speaking to the saints in Christ at Colossae. And what this means is that as you and I wage war with our sin, we do so from a position of victory and strength, not from a position of of despair and defeat. When Paul says, put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you, he's saying, you can do this. You can do this. As St. Augustine once said, God not only commands what he wills, but he also he gives what he commands. As, as Paul puts it in Philippians chapter 2, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There's the call. There's the, the imperative. Work out your salvation. And then what does Paul say? He says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. There is the indicative reality. Put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you, sexual immorality, Impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. God is going to judge the world on account of these sins. Sexual sin pervades our culture, doesn't it? And Paul is reminding us here that God is not mock. On account of these sins, the wrath of God is coming. And while Paul is certainly not saying that those who belong to Christ have any reason any longer to fear the wrath of God, what he is saying is that if God's wrath is going to destroy the world on account of these sins, then how can you possibly think that the same sins cannot yet do you great harm? Paul, you see, wants us to see the seriousness of our sin. Paul wants us to see that, that our ongoing sin is not something that we can afford to be indifferent towards. Not only because our sin is, is unacceptable in the sight of God, because our ongoing sin is so destructive to our communion with God, it's destructive to our, to our fellowship with the people of God. Just as any patient of sound mind would not dare to ignore the, the cancer present in his body, neither would any Christian of sound mind dare to ignore or remain indifferent to the ongoing sin in his life. For sin is so serious, says Paul, that it must be rooted out and put to death. For if you live according to the flesh, he says, you will die in Romans 8.13. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. There's a great Puritan pastor and theologian, John Owen, who who wrote in his book, The Mortification of Sin, that the choicest believers who are assuredly freed from the condemning power of sin 
ought yet to make it their business all their days to mortify the indwelling power of sin. And then he said, be always in the business of killing sin, or sin will be in the business of killing you. That's precisely what God's Word teaches us this morning. Put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. According to the Apostle Paul, this pursuit to kill sin and whatever is earthly in us must begin at the earliest stages. We must, we must mortify our sin from the inside out. We must kill it at the root, Paul is saying. And to, and to illustrate this principle, he uses sexual immorality as an example. Now, what Paul says here, we must recognize, applies to every kind of sin, not just sexual sin, but Paul's words apply to every kind of sin, but Paul zeroes in on sexual immorality. Perhaps this was a a struggle he was aware of in the church of Colossae. Perhaps that's a a struggle for many of us here. And Paul uses sexual immorality as the the umbrella category to show us how to to put sin to death. Paul says it must begin with with impurity, the the little compromises that we make and and what we watch, what we listen to, and, and how we speak. Because impurity leads to passion. Impurity begins to to alter our affections. And when our sinful passions are inflamed, we begin to desire and seek those things that God has said we cannot have. And when we do that, when we begin to covet those things that God has said we cannot have, we place those things above God, which is idolatry. Sin often begins so small and seemingly insignificant a Passing glass, a glance leads to a wandering thought, a wandering thought leads to sinful passions, and so on. And so Paul says you must identify sin at the earliest stages and kill it before it bears its poisonous fruit. Sin, and especially sexual sin, may promise you everything, but it delivers on nothing. It, it promises you joy and satisfaction and fulfillment. But it delivers on nothing. It will rob you of your joy. It will disrupt your communion with God. It will make you feel as though you're nothing but a hypocrite and a fraud. And so Paul says that you must put these sins to death. Be always in the business of killing sin. Or sin will be in the business of killing you. The way our ESV Bibles translate Paul's words, put to death, is perhaps too euphemistic because in the Greek language it is Paul's way of saying in the strongest way possible that you must identify what is trying to kill you and you need to kill it. Are you taking your sin seriously? Do you hate your sin? When temptation comes, do you Do you run away from sin as fast as you can, like Joseph did from Potiphar's wife? Are you giving no opportunity to the devil? When that thought enters your mind, a a lustful thought, a greedy thought, an envious thought, a a malicious thought, whatever it is, do do you take that thought captive by the word of Christ and kill it? Are you taking your sin seriously? Or are you rather coddling your sins and making room in your hearts to entertain sin, even for a little while? If so, then let me ask you, how's that working out for you? Are you experiencing the joy of the Christian life that way? Do you feel like you're flourishing in the faith that way? Or is it rather quite exhausting and discouraging I'm reminded of the Puritan pastor who was once approached by one of his parishioners who who came to him saying, Pastor, you know, there are still these sins in my life that I'm wrestling with, and I feel that there are just these cobwebs of sin all throughout my life that are clouding everything. Pastor, what should I do? And the pastor say, You say there are cobwebs of sin in your life. What then should you do? Kill the spider. Don't make light of it. Kill the spider. Beloved, do you really want to overcome 
sin in your life? If so, then you need to take the word of God seriously. I need to take the word of God seriously. What again did Jesus himself say in Matthew chapter 5? If your right eye causes you to sin, what then should you do? Should you simply put a patch on it? No, he said, pluck it out and throw it away. And if your right hand causes you to sin, what should you do? Should you simply put a glove on it? Cover it up? No, he said, it's better that you cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that one of your members should be cut off than that your whole body should be thrown into the fires of hell. Are we taking our sin seriously? Of course, Jesus was not calling his disciples to self-mutilation, but speaking by way of hyperbole and metaphor, Jesus was calling his disciples to see the seriousness of their sin and to take drastic action in how they were dealing with their sin. We need to identify those things in our lives that are leading us astray, and we need to remove them. We need to cut off access from them. We have to stop making excuses for them and stop making excuses for our sins. As we're reminded in Articles 4 and 5 of the fifth head of the Canons of Doctrine, our ongoing sins deserve the sentence of death. They grieve the Holy Spirit. They suspend the exercise of faith. They They severely wound the conscience and sometimes cause us to lose the awareness of God's grace and favor. Isn't this what David Expressed in the song we just sang, while I kept guilty silence, my strength was spent with grief. Thy hand was heavy on me, and I felt no relief. This is what unconfessed and unmortified sin gets you. It robs you of your joy, it wounds your conscience, it grieves the spirit, it makes you feel as though God is far away. And if this is your experience this morning, then I urge you on behalf of Christ to repent. Confess your sins. Bring your sin into the open. Don't be too proud to ask for help. The Apostle Paul calls us elsewhere to bear one another's burdens in the Lord. Confess your sins to one another, he says. We as Christians aren't to live out our lives as lone rangers. Don't be too proud to confess your sins, to seek help in mortifying your sin. Confess your sin. Confess your sin and experience the joy of God's forgiving grace. As we heard in our assurance of pardon, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. He is exalted to show mercy to you. Satan would have us to believe that when we've been living in sin, the last thing we should do is go to God. One minute, Satan is there as the great tempter, saying, you've earned this, just just give in to this. And the next moment, he's the great accuser, saying, you dare not go to God now. He'll want nothing to do with you now. What does God say? How does God reveal himself? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways. My ways, declares the Lord. When God says that, when God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, God is saying, "I, I don't think in the same way that you think. When someone sins against you, your initial reaction is to be angry and hold a grudge against that person, to want nothing to do with that person. And sometimes we think that that's God's dealing with us. But in Isaiah 55, God is saying, you have no comprehension as to the magnitude of my mercy. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. Why? In order that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon This is the God of the Bible as he reveals himself to us in the person of Christ. 
As King David went on to sing in Psalm 32, But when I owned my trespass, my sin hid not from thee. When I confessed transgression, then thou forgavest me. This is the joy of our salvation congregation. We have a Savior who not only convicts us of our sin, but who who also comforts us in the midst of our struggle against sin. He speaks to us with words like, like, therefore, he tells us that, that we can do the things he's calling us to do. He comes to us with his precious promises of his word. He assures us that, as the Apostle John says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. He comes to you this morning and says, when God sees you, he sees his only beloved son. And if you're despairing, In your struggle with sin, Christ also says to you, because I love you, because you've been raised with me, because your life is is hidden with me, Christ says, tomorrow doesn't have to be like yesterday. And the sins of last week, they don't need to be the sins of this week. And unlike the devil, Christ's fingers aren't crossed behind his back. Jesus isn't lying when he says in Titus chapter 2 that the grace of God has appeared to do what? To train us, to teach us, to enable us, to empower us, to to renounce all ungodliness and to live self-controlled and upright lives in this present age as we wait for the hope of Jesus Christ. The sins of last week don't need to be the sins of this week. For you have put off the old self with its practices, says Paul. When you came to Christ in faith, when you were justified in Christ, your old man was put to death. As Paul says in Galatians 3, verse 20, you have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer you who lives, but but Christ who lives in you. You have put off the old self. That's happened. That's your reality. You have put off the old self with its practices. And you have put on the new self, which is continuously and progressively being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. You've been incorporated into a new humanity. No longer are you blinded by your sin. No longer are your ears too deaf and your hearts too hard to to receive gospel instruction from the Lord Jesus. But now with, with new eyes and new ears and new hearts and new minds, You've been made able to walk in his ways. That's the truth of Lord's Day 44. That the Christian begins to make a small beginning of obedience in this life. It's a small beginning, but it's a real beginning. It's a real beginning. Paul highlights this very thing when he says in these two, you once walked when you were still living in them. But now you must put them all away. Paul, you see, is orienting us to the reality that when you came to faith in Christ, God made a, a breach with your old man, a breach with your sin, and he, and he set you on a level path. He set you on the path of, of repentance. And this God did with, with the promise of Philippians chapter 1, that he who began a good work in you will do what? He will, he will bring that work to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. God's not going to abandon you in the process of sanctification. As you wage war against sin and the temptations of the flesh, God does not abandon his soldiers in the fight. As Paul says to Timothy or Titus when he was in prison, everyone left me and fled, but God, the Lord, stood by me. That's what God does with us. Throughout the course of our life, he stands beside us to lead us and guide us. He sanctifies us. So here in verses 7 and 10, 7 to 10, Paul is describing a new humanity. When he says in these two, you once walked and you were living in them, he's appealing to the reality of their rescue. These sins at one time had, had been their whole world. These sins had, had been their whole way of life. But Christ rescued them. He caused them to be born against that those sins and vices that used to define them didn't need to define them any longer. 
And this is why Paul says that now you must put all these things away. Wrath, malice, slander, obscene, talk from your mouth and do not lie to one another. These things are, are beneath you. Like the list of sins in verse 5, so also the list of sins here in verses 8 and 9 belong to the kingdom of, of darkness. They too must be put away. All your anger and your wrath and your malice and your obscene talk must be rooted out of your lives and it must, they must be killed in the service of God and one another. Those things belong to the old man, says Paul. And we have put on the new man. And this is perhaps a better way to translate Paul's words in verses 9 and 10, rather than using the word self, which could perhaps confuse us to think that we have two selves or, or two persons in us. What Paul is seeking to press home here is the reality that those who have been raised to newness of life, they no longer stand in solidarity with, with the first man, the old man, the first man, Adam. But they now stand in solidarity with the new man, the last man, the last Adam, the Lord Jesus. That's what Paul is pressing home here. When Adam fell into sin, wrath and anger and malice filled his heart and the whole human race fell with him. And by nature, we stood in solidarity with him. We were rebel soldiers and in Adam's army, fists raised against the God of heaven. That's who we were. But Paul says, you've put off that old man. What Adam lost, Christ has regained. Where Adam failed, Christ prevailed. And through his resurrection, Jesus ushered in a new humanity. He is the the first fruits of this great resurrection harvest that begins already now in this life. As Lord's Day 17 says, already now, I have this power in my heart and my life, this newness of life. This is what Paul is is pressing home here. Your position in the old Adam has been spiritually destroyed and has been replaced by a new position. In the last Adam, the Lord Jesus, a new position that that Paul describes in Ephesians 2 as being seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's your new position. And in him and through him, you're being made to be more and more like him. As we are sanctified by the Spirit, we are more and more being renewed in knowledge after the image of our Creator. We are more and more conformed into the image of our Savior so that the more that we mortify our sin, the more we begin to mirror our Savior, as we'll see in verses 12 and following. According to Paul, writes William Hendrickson, The believer's new nature resembles that of a growing plant. It is being constantly renewed by the Holy Spirit and it increases in vigor with a definite goal in mind, namely to make you holy as he is holy. You and I have been made to share in a new humanity. And having been made to share in a new humanity, God has also brought us into a new community, which is the last thing for us to consider this morning. What again does Paul say In verse 11, here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. But in this new community, Christ is all, and Christ is is in all. Here in verse 11, Paul is is working out the theology of verses 9 and 10 in terms of its implications for the church. When it comes to the, the work of Christ in our lives, there are both personal as well as as corporate dimensions and implications. And one of the corporate implications of our union with Christ is that whatever barriers continue to separate cultures and classes in our world today are are torn down by the gospel. It's a theme that Paul presses home again and again and again throughout his letters. He says in 1 Corinthians 12, for example, for there is, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, all were made to drink of, of the one spirit, he says. As he says in Galatians 3, 28, for as many of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, and so there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And this is the gospel note that Paul is sounding here in verse 11. Verse 11. 
You sound in this gospel note that this glorious and progressive transformation into the image of God recognizes no racial, religious, cultural, or, or social boundaries. He's saying that God's, God's grace bridges all chasms. Therefore, writes William Hendrickson, racial bigotry, chauvinism, and snobbery are all condemned here. And here the truth that before God all men are equal receives its best infallibly inspired expression. What unites me the most of you is not the fact that we, most of us happen to have Dutch last names, but what unites us together is the transformative power of the gospel. What unites us together is the reality that God has been gracious to, to answer our Savior's high priestly prayer that, that we should be one even as he and the Father are one. For Christ, says Paul, is all and in all. Paul is saying that Christ, as the all-sufficient Lord and Savior, is all that matters. The very same Christ of Colossians 1, who is before all things and in whom all things are held together, is also holding us together in the bonds of Christian faith and love. As one pastor has put it, there is a cosmic dimension to Christ's saving work that goes beyond the mere salvation of one group of people. For the scope of his saving work is able to reach into every nook and cranny of our diverse race, bringing people from every conceivable background into the fellowship of his family. This is the glorious picture that we find in Revelation 7, isn't it? A great multitude that no one could number, comprising peoples of every tribe and tongue and nation, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And this is the glorious vision that you and I need to keep ever before our eyes as as we take heed of the apostles' instruction, as we seek to to put to death and to put away whatever is earthly in us, we need to do so with this glorious vision always before our eyes that a day is coming when we ourselves, with all God's people everywhere, shall, shall stand before the throne in white robes, not robes stained with the sins of the old man, but we'll stand before the throne in white robes. And together we'll cry out with all God's people everywhere, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come before you again and we give you thanks that you have spoken to us in the reading and preaching of the word. Father, we pray that your word would indeed penetrate deeply into our hearts and lives. That as we go to our homes this afternoon, we would examine our lives. Consider the areas of sin that continue to linger in our lives. And that we would develop a strategy and a plan to put those sins to death. May that be our commitment this morning, O oh God. To no longer coddle our sin no longer make room for our sin, but to kill our sin. Father, we pray that for those of us whose consciences may be wounded, perhaps some of us here are living in ongoing sin, perhaps sexual sin. Lord, may we see that your grace is sufficient for us, And that you not only command what you will, but you give what you command. You enable us by the power of the Spirit to do the things that you call us to do. And so, Father, if we are living in sin, may we not harden our hearts this morning. May we not raise another barrier of pride around us, but may we topple those walls of pride over and confess our sins one to another. And so experience the joy of your forgiving grace. Lord, we thank you that you have brought us into a new humanity and a new community. That in Christ, we have put off the old and we have put on the new. And we thank you, Lord, that you never leave us nor forsake us, but you continue to sanctify us so that we begin more and more to reflect our Savior in this world. 
We thank you, Lord, for being brought into a community, the Church of Christ. That we have unity and fellowship with each other in the bonds of Christian faith and love. Strengthen our ties, strengthen our bonds as believers, Lord. As we look to Christ and wait for Christ and the hope of his appearing. This we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.